Welcome to the panel on building integrated cloud and edge strategy. We called it the why, the how, and the how good, because we hope we'll tackle why you should bother, how you do it, and how you measure it. Um, we had a, a panel last year on edge, and it ended up at the very end of the day. And we still had um, a good turnout, so I thought that was a real indication of the interest in this area. Um, last year we talked a lot about definitional issues sort of around where cloud was 10 years ago, what is edge, what does it mean, and I think a measure of some of the um, evolution and rapid change in this area is that this year we're talking about cloud and we're talking about edge, but we have several practitioners that have um, been able to join us. So. Um, a big welcome to Marie-José Drouin, who's the CIO for the National Film Board of Canada. Uh, Scott Killian, who's the VP of IT Efficient Programs and Director at Uptime Institute. Erwin Van Hoot, who's the CTO of the Hospital for Sick Children. And also Jeff Cowan, who's the CTO for HCE Telecom. So we have a great panel. Thanks very much for helping us out with this important topic today. Um, I wanted to start with Scott, who has a, <laughs> a wide view of the, um, of the industry based on your daily work, but also, Scott, based on management of a network that, of, um, of 47 companies that engage in P2P, so peer-to-peer -peer sharing of best practices. So from this vantage point, where you talk to a lot of people um, on a daily basis, what can you share with the audience on what's driving enterprise thinking about cloud and edge strategy? Okay, well, thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit on the Uptime Institute network, uh, as Mary mentioned, 47 end users and owner operators only. So it's only enterprise end users, co-location end users, so it really, it truly is a yeah. So a pulse, so to speak, of, of that, of who actually owns and operates facilities. Um, we've been running that network for, oh, since the mid-90s now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been very beneficial to get insight, uh, et cetera. So uh, we also conduct a survey every year, which maybe you've seen, uh, the Uptown Institute mm -hmm. survey that, that's conducted in it. Also gives us some insight into what people are thinking. I think this year there were over 800 respondents thereabouts uh, into that survey. And from a strategy perspective, it's kind of interesting that uh, the survey results indicated that, yes, everybody's thinking about edge, mm -hmm. but there is this perception that it's going to be exploding now, and most of the people that responded did not think it was going to be exploding in 2019. They thought it was going to be on the horizon that people were thinking about it, planning about it, trying to come up with a strategy, trying to come up with an overall data center strategy, which is really where we got involved with a lot of our members. Mm -hmm. And they're still vacillating, right? They're still not sure what the right approach is. Um, um, on top of that, uh, some other survey data. I know we talked, we heard a little bit earlier about how uh, the, the, the expectations is that enterprise data centers are going away. Um, that supposedly from our survey data is also not the case. Even though we see a you know big building of hyperscale facilities, people moving into co-location spaces, there still is a need for the enterprise facilities, and there's uh, the indication was that no time soon do enterprise people expect those facilities to just be eliminated off the map. So with that in mind, it kind of opens up the thought of how you have to strategize and come up with an approach for how you're going to deal with edge, cloud, mm -hmm. your existing facilities. Um, and the surveys data helped us out there again and said that mostly everybody who responded, uh, better than 50%, probably closer to 70, indicated that they had some sort of a hybrid strategy, which is what we heard in the last session. Mm -hmm. So. There is that hybrid strategy that they're presently using. Some of, it may, some of it may consist of using Edge. In most cases, they're finding that they're still trying to figure out how to go with Edge, but uh, overall, they are planning some sort of a hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's really what the data shows us. Uh, and that's what working with some of our, uh, our, our network members has shown us as well. Right now. Sure. Yeah, that's great. So, Erwin, maybe you could share your real life experience because you, know, you had end of life for one of your data centers and you did some. Uh, public cloud um, deployment, and also you also worked in your planning around some workloads and co-location facilities. 
but you recently added a fourth element. So could you talk to us about how that kind of evolved and more complex hybrid strategy developed? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me first describe our data center landscape at uh, CKIDS. We have two on-premise data centers. One is in our research facility, is a more modern uh, tier three data center, smaller footprint, and less expansion capabilities. But critical to the hospital, because we are running our hospital electronic medical record application in that data center. So very critical, 24 by seven, hence we have a tier three data center in that research facility. In the hospital itself, we have an old aging data center from the early 90s, and it's situated in the older part of the building that we will demolish because we are going to build a new inpatient tower by 2028. Like most organizations, we have developed a hybrid IT model um, end of 2017, which was predominantly based on cloud and the move to an external co-location facility. No word, and I agree with Scott, no discussions internal about edge computing. Mm -hmm. So end of last year, we had some discussions with ind industry experts on edge computing, the message on that technology or edge computing is evolving in the preferred architecture for running data-driven intelligent applications. That means those applications like Internet of Things, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, technologies that we are considering at SickKids because of our new buildings that we will get, means that we have to change our strategy and it's now not just public or um, private cloud, it's also the move to an external co-location facility and on top of that we now have to consider edge computing. Our feeling was okay, we have time to define, but in the meantime our eMERGE department is already looking at virtual reality for pain management with children. So mm -hmm. those applications are coming very rapidly mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that we adapt ourselves with that hybrid IT model where we need to make sure that we are walking in the right direction. And it's really to get the data, the right data into the right place. And that for us, I think, is a major journey that we still are embarking on. Okay. Thanks very much, Erwin. So, uh, Jeff, you have another perspective altogether as a provider of communications infrastructure. So, from this perspective, what do you see as driving a trend towards cloud and edge resource strategies? Yeah, so um, just very briefly, as uh, HCE stands for Hamilton Community Energy, uh, and we incorporated a telecom company in 2015, and our, our, we're solely owned by the city of of Hamilton, it's just uh, Hamilton Community Energy Telecoming for a very long email handle. But we come at it from a really interesting uh, angle in that um, uh, we look at it both from uh, energy services and a, and a telecommunications server provider perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I'll answer a bit of this question um, in a very uh, figurative sense and I'll offer one with a little bit of a future looking perspective. Um, as a communication provider, if I hear somebody talk about virtualizing a firewall in the air one more time, I'm <laughs> uh, there are certain elements of our organization that we do leverage compute on the edge. There are certain things regarding subscriber management. There are certain things regarding application routing. There are certain things uh, regarding um, security that it has made sense to push certain functions closer to the infrastructure where the subscribers, where the actual um, uh, command and control is, is, is required. Uh, but still, it, it represents a relatively small total portion of, of the general compute that we have inside of our of our infrastructure. Uh, maybe from putting my hat from a community angle, however mm -hmm. though, mm -hmm. you know, there's and, and where we're seeing engagements and they're really starting to ask some questions that I do not know the answer of yeah, but when you start seeing the potential for uh, autonomous technology in a community, uh, when you even start looking at the concept of a hybrid car today, you know, there is some research uh, down out there that um, you know it shows that a hybrid car today generates about 25 gigabytes worth of unique data an hour okay so now you take a look in the context of the city of Hamilton there's approximately about 4500 uh, municipal based parking spots in the city of Hamilton well now if you start taking a look at the proliferation of smarter more autonomous technology that's possibly consuming these places well do you consider a car edge computer? Will you consider a bus edge compute, because I can tell you there is a lot of, of, of processing capability and there's a lot of intelligence now 
that is starting to exist in a very dynamic fashion out uh, within the municipality. And, um, and we're seeing now the needs of even the concept of edge compute. Is there a broader benefit more than just cost? And I know if you're operators and you have to manage CapEx and OpEx, but if you're a municipality, we quantify value in three ways. So obviously, one's an economic value, one's a social value, and one's an environmental value. And, and I think in the idea of, of edge and, and computing farther out, is there an element to play more than just specifically cost? cost? Interesting. <clears throat> I hadn't thought about the environmental aspect. Let's talk about that later. <laughs> um, Marie Jose, when uh, the NFB was transitioning to new kinds of infrastructure, what were some of the key inputs to the decision making for you? The, the key inputs are uh, regular, we are a media company, so we do uh, complete the integrated production to post-production and all the way to distribution to consumers. So the drivers were um, either bandwidth, if you go to the consumer and you will need to have bandwidth that changes all the time to the consumers, we needed to go closer to them, so we uh, outsourced to an OVP, which is basically replicating your content all the way to the user. So that, that was one first driver. The other bandwidth driver is we produce 4K content, long form, so it takes a lot of bandwidth. So it drives the equipment closer to the producers. So we basically, uh, audiovisual uh, services, we put them closer to the ones that are doing it because the bandwidth and the storage is not something that is acceptable in the remote location. Mm -hmm. The uh, other uh, reason is also we are very a small team that are not there, 724, 365, and basically we uh, service the consumers. The consumers are not there during business hours. They want service, they want uh, reliability outside of business hours and putting our services that are uh, connecting to the consumer in the cloud is helping us uh, in that side. So reliability and, and uh, uptime is, is basically a good thing for that. So my team is not uh, so uh, demanded. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and also, just of note, um, when we think about edge, we often think about edge being a novel technology or a novel approach, but you've been doing edge technology yeah, yeah, I for have, some I, time I've now. been doing yeah, special events, I did Olympics and stuff like that in my previous life, and yes, that's what we did, and it's super funny because they are migrating the other way. Mm -hmm. They used to be, when you do Olympics, you do, um, for example, uh, IOC, International Operations Center, mm -hmm. and basically we shipped equipment all the way and all the people in the uh, Olympic uh, village, and uh, that's what they used to do. And the last event I did, which is a little bit in the past, the World Cup in Rio, mm -hmm. and they did the complete reverse. Basically, they sent raw footage back to NBC, and, and uh, so from Brazil, we had uh, above, uh, uh, 30 gig of uh, bandwidth going back to the states from Brazil. Whoa. So that, that industry is moving the other way around. Okay, interesting. Um, so, you know, you've mentioned that you needed to focus on core mandate, right? Which is maybe not infrastructure management. You have also needed um, flexibility so that you have bandwidth intensive delivery of applications and security and reliability in service delivery. These were key things that we had a discussion about earlier. How did cloud and how did edge help you get there? So uh, basically the, the first thing, uh, uh, edge as I discussed is helped us with the reliability and quality for my consumers because it, it got us closer to them and it was dynamically moving depending on who the customer was. On the cloud side, uh, it gives us it gave us the possibility of being a lot more flexible and having a lot less volume. For example, I have customers because we do interactive productions, we do platforms, we do all sorts of different productions. And when they come to us with infrastructure, they don't know what they want. They don't know what they need. And when they do, we need to be quick. So basically we worked agile with them in building that infrastructure, and if it doesn't meet what they're trying to do, we just removed it and, and put another one. If you needed to buy equipment to all of the different alternatives we go through, mm -hmm. we would be broke. 
So the cloud is giving us that flexibility that you basically implement something, you try, doesn't work, you, you put something else. So that the cloud is giving us that easy, uh, easiness of uh, flexibility. Okay, so the ability to respond without breaking the bank. Exactly. Excellent. Um, so uh, cost, reliability, flexibility, Scott, are some uh, end goals at the NFB. When you're thinking about best practices, and you know, you're know you in a consultant's role at this table anyways, um, you know, the answer is often it depends on the environment. So we were hoping that you could give us an example or two of you know, what the vertical industry requirements are. If people are thinking about cloud versus edge or a mix of you know, different platforms, you know, how does the vertical um, need change the equation? Uh, it, it changes it quite a bit. I mean, as, as we've heard throughout the day, it, it, it depends on the business, right? I mean, that's really what the driver is. It's, yeah. if, if you have to be in tune with your customers. We heard that in the, in the session before. You have to know what they want. You have to know what their requirements are. You have to know them in and out, um, which is part of the problem in, in the data center industry today is that we find still data center folks are over here, IT folks are over here. They're still not fully connected in a lot of organizations, uh, which creates a, a, you know, kind of a dysfunctional family type of approach, right? They're trying to, the data center people are probably always trying to play catch up to the IT folks. The IT folks don't really know maybe what the data center is doing in a lot of extent, or, what, or maybe they don't even know what the costs are at the data center level, so they, they tend to look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. They tend to maybe do their own research and looking toward a cloud provider. So the, those two entities really need to not be siloed, as we're saying, they need to be mm -hmm. a functional family. They need to be together. Uh, we've seen that done with a separate type of org chart, but mm -hmm. it's usually best if you have it under one organization, usually on the IT side, where the facilities folks report to that IC side organization it tends to work best, but mm -hmm. you can do it the other way as well. So um, that would be one best practice, is, is, is really to try and, and, and uh, get the two organizations together. Um, whether you have them in the same org or not, get them together. Mm -hmm. uh, the second I would say is, is as we already said, know your customer. Know, know what the customer wants, know where they're going, know where they're headed. Uh, for Edge, it's somewhat difficult, as we heard MJ say. I mean, she has to react quickly. Uh, that's part of what Edge is, right? That's part of the advantage of Edge in itself, is that you have to be able to be flexible and, and to act quickly. Um, we've got some of our clients in the network, as an example, that uh, retail, prime mm -hmm. example. Uh, the, the retail folks are maybe a little bit further along on the Edge. Uh, the Walmarts of the world, the, you know, the, the, those people like that, they're already thinking about how they're going to distribute, how they're going to deal with it. They have facilities or, or little pops that they build at each of their facilities, each of their stores perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas financial folks, as we heard uh, RBC talking about, a lot more rigid, right? They're not, they're not able to really do that as of yet. So depending on the customer needs really determines how you can strategize or develop your overall data center strategy. And that's really what we're seeing. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the two big ones is try and, you know, try and break down the silos so that you have the facilities folks dealing with the IT folks directly and then just know what your business unit or customer really wants and then <coughs> plan accordingly around it. Yeah. It sounds pretty simple, but it's not as simple as it's no. um, Thanks for that, Scott. And, and the first time I heard Discussions of the need for the IT and the business, or sorry, the IT and the facilities folks to talk to each other more handily was at an uptime show. So that was a, quite a few years ago now. I'm dating myself, but we, we've been talking about it a while. <laughs> yes, now. yeah. An integrated organization, and yes, it has it, a lot of organizations have moved that way, but there's still some that haven't, and they still yeah. operate effectively if yeah. if they if they can communicate. But there's some that are still dysfunctional. Right, right. So um, to move back from organization to technology, Erwin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, we've heard about application focus as something that's driving a lot of strategy. And um, in some of the conversations that we had earlier, you talked about a term called intelligent IoT for healthcare, which is something new to me. So I thought maybe a few of you would also like to understand more about that. So. Um, what is it? Intelligent IoT for healthcare. What kind of applications? And what are some best practices around building out the infrastructure to support it? So companies are incorporating artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning in their Internet of Things 
applications or products, mm -hmm. hence the term intelligent internet of things for healthcare. I have two examples, but it, I think it's still early days because it's one of those buzzwords that you hear and then you think, oh my God, what is that going to mean for us? One is the uh, hospital beds with early sense artificial intelligence, meaning those beds are continuously monitoring the vital signs of the patients and they will alert the nurses if a change is detected. Mm -hmm. So that means that that application, and it's going back to the edge computing discussion, discussion, it's the autonomy of decision, it's very low latency, and it's a lot of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So it's not traffic that can go to the cloud and back, mm -hmm. or to your external colocation facility and back. You need to keep that data traffic locally. Another is a more um, is the continuous uh, glucose monitoring system mm -hmm. that uses a sensor implement, implanted be, uh, below the skin of the patient mm -hmm. will capture the uh, blood glucose levels of a patient for 90 days. Again, traffic that doesn't go to the cloud. And back, you would like to keep that uh, traffic local to your building. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole discussion that we are having within SickKids IMT because we will probably see more and more of those intelligent internet of things for healthcare mm -hmm. and how do we deal with that massive amount of data that we do not want to go back and forth because the decision is so critical and it is very latency sensitive. So we try to figure out what the journey will mean for us in building that edge computing and at kits with the two new buildings. Mm -hmm. So um, the latency um, point is well taken. What about um, privacy of that data? Well, it's um, definitely a discussion we are having with security and privacy. Okay. Uh, if we can keep the, uh, the data locally, mm -hmm. then we are less sensitive to the privacy, but mm -hmm. it's definitely a mm -hmm. discussion that we need to have because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's PHA data. So you cannot right. just consider that you, do, you would like to do whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah, so the less it has to move, the less vulnerable yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah indeed. Cool. Um, so, Jeff, I'd like to ask you a question that kind of combines the cloud learnings and the edge learnings. So, um, it's taken about a decade or so to define a services model for cloud computing. And now we're moving to a more sophisticated construct, whether it's, you know, a four-part hybrid IT or whether it's edge. Is there something... Is, what you know, thinking about a new services model, what would it look like, and is there something that we can take from cloud that would help inform this new, more complex construct? Uh, if, I, if I knew exactly what it would look like, I'd become a very wealthy person. But <laughs> I would, um, I would say, as I remember seeing uh, hype cycles and some of the industry best uh, analysts looking at cloud as being an emerging concept probably as little as, as 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. now you're actually starting to see a lot of organizations starting to move uh, meaningful workloads into a cloud-based services model. But there's a lot of organizations that are still scratching their head about how do they move classic workloads still into, into <coughs> cloud-based models. Uh, I heard some CIOs say that their path to compliancy um, is really uh, pivotal around aligning themselves with uh, industry best of, of, of breed to get to fail fast and, and take those learnings and quickly uh, iterate them into their mm -hmm. processes to come up with industry best processes that they'll be able to achieve that faster mm -hmm. than, than, than they're going through it on their own part of the organization. But, um, you know, certainly I, I really see a future if you start talking about concepts of IoT and autonomy and you are going to see the concept of scaling for the masses. Uh, um, it, it's not going to be just mm -hmm. for the biggest and the best globally. You're going to start seeing now organizations that are operating whatever that definition of hyperscale is now mm -hmm. at, at a much more regional, a much more micro-defined perspective. And in doing that, it, it, you can't have a lot of manual intervention, right? You, you have to embrace um, machine learning processes. You have to have systems that can iterate uh, on their own accord. You're, uh, you're, you're going to have to be experts at engineering business processes. Those mm -hmm. business processes are going to have mm -hmm. to be modeled in the concept of almost digital avatars because the processes are going to be so complex and so at scale uh, that it's not going to be uh, classic uh, principles about how you monitor, how you maintain, how, how, how you secure. Um, 
security, obvious, uh, uh, data privacy. Uh, I think as you're starting to see these concepts and you're starting to see um, uh, more engagement deeper inside of, of uh, consumers' behavior, mm -hmm. things about privacy are going to become front and center and, and people who operate compute environments today who've never had to be front and center and answer to things about data privacy all of a sudden are going to have to be uh, uh, well positioned to understand the implications, almost think about uh, that as a part of design. And, and, and lastly, I, I think what we're going to see is you're going to see the idea of being able to test and develop something in a lab is going to disappear. If something is going to be of such large scale that mm -hmm. the field is also not only going to be your active service that you're delivering, it's also going to be your test and development bed, and the two are going to have to exist in, in parallel to one another. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to actually effectively design or develop something on scale because effectively you'll never be able to do it just simply within the, the, the four, four walls of a laboratory. So no more waterfalls. I wouldn't say no more, but I think you'll start seeing it become Less and less and less of Exactly. Thanks very much. So that's a nice segue when you talked about automating processes um, to the last set of questions that I had for the panel, which is around metrics, because we love metrics and milestones. Um, Scott, and I wonder, you know, if I could, um, you know, call on you first in this section. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about in the panel about, you know, cloud strategies, edge strategies, and integrating them. So, you know, just at a, at a top level, what's behind that? Why do you need to have an integrated strategy? And what's the best way for an organization to measure success in developing that integration? Okay. Uh, I think what's behind it is, as we said, it's just it's the way the business is going. It's the need of the business. Whether you're retail, financial, hospital, telecom, media, your business is taking you in that direction. You wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for the business. And you probably wouldn't be looking at integrating or having a hybrid type of model if it wasn't efficient or cost effective. Mm -hmm. right? it, 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 you're not gonna do it otherwise. You'd still be building your own brick and mortar facilities or you'd be doing something else. Uh, so it all comes back to cost in my view. I mean, it, it's, it's the mighty dollar, right? I mean, that's, that's what drives it to a large extent. I mean, there are obviously some customer needs, maybe some latency needs those sort of things, environmental needs, but bottom line, I think we see at the, at the, at the higher level, at the C-suite level is, is it saving me money? What's the advantage, right? What's the benefit? What's the ROI? Uh, and so that, that tends to be the real driver that we see for a lot of folks. And that's maybe why a lot of our network members haven't quite jumped yet full in, in a lot of extent, because they haven't been able to justify the cost of all mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still seeing, they're not seeing the total benefit yet. I mean, it's, it, I think they will ultimately, it's a matter of time but I think they haven't seen it yet. So uh, uh, from that perspective, I think that's, that's that, 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 that I think is what is, is a big drive. It's a, I think it's a huge drive from, from, from that perspective. Sure, so um, cost measure. So, so metrics would be cost, right? What's the ROI uh -huh. uh, is one of the things. Uh, uh, another thing we see is, is obviously people are monitoring to see how beneficial this is. They're, they're monitoring it from an implementation perspective. How fast was I able to deploy, uh, you know, Project management teams get formed, organizations get created to just run these sort of projects to bring things online. Um, overall, I think we, we've seen from a lot of our customers that they, they know how to deploy things at the edge. Um, based on the last uh, panel, there's obviously some intricacies, but I think overall there's, 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 there's a basic understanding of how to do it or, or, or what they would need to do. I mean, there's a set set of you know requirements that have to be almost like a hyper converged converge little environment mm -hmm. in a rack or a couple of racks where that scenario is. Mm -hmm. So we, we we don't think that's really the, the, the issue or the or the or the or the detriment. I mean it's really implementation, scheduling, um, making sure they have the re right resources in place, which is a huge thing that they assume to get getting resources. Uh, so that's been that seems to have been another way to track it is how you how you would convert how you would actually deploy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, also, I think once you have that, we've heard every, everybody is planning on doing it autonomously, monitoring, there has to be monitoring in place. So similar metrics that you would monitor a data center only at a smaller scale. What's the you know, alarms, um, power usage, et cetera. Well, coming back to kind of driving operating expenses to measure that sort of thing. So um, I think those are probably the, the underlying metrics that we're seeing that are, that are 
being utilized to, to, to some extent, mm -hmm. to, or to a large extent, I think, actually. Thank you very much. Um, cost at the top of the list. MJ, so you're on the record as saying <laughs> cost is really not um, necessarily a metric of success at the NFE in infrastructure deployment. I'm not saying overall. So, you know, what other measures and metrics do you use to monitor success, performance, and service delivery? Uh, operations costs, the CFO wants to reduce that, no worry. That's part of our <laughs> metrics. But I've never seen a customer coming to me and say, oh my God, your deployment costs so little. <laughs> the, never I have a complaint about this, never. The complaint I have is, yeah. oh my God, it's not fast enough. Oh my God, it's not reliable. Yeah. That's basically more what I'm talking about. Because really, uh, the cost of deployment is normally such a small part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you want to deploy an edge or not, mm -hmm. of course it's part of the factor you take into account, but it's not a metric. Mm -hmm. Really, the metrics is what do you need? What kind of service do you need? And how fast and how flexible is it? Because we do have, uh, on our side, uh, no control over how much a consumer is going to look at our stuff. So if we deploy, often we deploy interactive productions and there's a big festival and the traffic goes pew all, all the way to the sky mm -hmm. and then we need to be really quick in spinning those servers, those computers and, and the storage uh, as, as we need or some other time there's barely any traffic so we re reduce it. So flexibility is a big, big, big matrix. Mm -hmm. Speed of execution for our mm -hmm. customer is number one. Mm -hmm. And um, edge is not uh, the, uh, the good thing cloud is for that kind of thing. Uh, if uh, there's needs to be uh, there. So really, that's uh, effectively a cost is not a factor for the implementation of our services. Okay, so you described servicing internal clients who are consuming your services, but also external end users who may have additional needs and requirements, and both of those are things that you have to address. Yes. Yeah, cool. So, um, Erwin, in your very complex infrastructure environment, um, how are you going to coordinate and, you know, understand whether or not you're optimizing service delivery as a whole? So. I'm thinking in these different applications, how do you know which kind of infrastructure you need for what? And you know, what's the process around that that you guys are developing? So we have started an engagement with an external organization to perform a very comprehensive workload focus discovery and analysis of our current infrastructure and application landscape. That engagement should give us a detailed migration roadmap Mm -hmm. but also to a level where specific workload, workload will better fit with Cloud Provider A than B, and other workloads will maybe better fit with Cloud Provider B. And I think that that will help us to make sure that when we are going to move to that external co-location facility that, or the public cloud, that we know mm -hmm. which workload will fit mm -hmm. where. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important engagement for us, and that's for the next uh, six nine months, from proving to our executives that we have <coughs> made the right decisions, mm -hmm. we, we have moved our direction on dashboards to our executives. I think it's time to tell the IT value story to our business that mm -hmm. matters to them. Doesn't mean that the first call resolution of your service desk is not important, or how many changes you have implemented successfully is not important to them, but they need to have more information than just the technology. Meaning what we are trying to do is translate our infrastructure on business outcomes, looking at patient safety, cost efficiency, and risk mitigation. That could mean that if we have an availability of four nines, mm -hmm. that means we did not have a lot of unplanned downtime, hence the business did not have to go to downtown procedure, mm -hmm. which means paper can mean human errors, that itself, I think, is what we need to translate, and that's that IT value story, mm -hmm. so that the business understands it's not just cost. There's a lot we can do around availability, expense, performance of business-critical 
applications, but it has to be translated to business outcomes, not the traditional technology dashboards. Interesting. So what kinds of things would be on those dashboards as opposed to the technology dashboards? Well, I think it's around uh, availability of a ap business critical application. Okay. It's looking at what is the cost okay. and what is the performance. Okay. Is the performance where we do not have um, issues that users are complaining about, mm -hmm. the performance of a specific critical application, that means we are doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to translate that in what is the business outcome, what were the business objectives, mm -hmm. and do we help as an IT organization mm -hmm. in doing that. Cool. So he's taking your advice, Scott. <laughs> that's, that's one. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Jeff, metrics is always challenging because, you know, we've heard at the table and I'm sure in other organizations and other environments and in specific projects, there are always unique KPIs, different things to measure. So, you know, rather than, you know, saying, well, we need to measure this, is there another way of looking at it more um, process oriented? You brought up the, the point about process automation <laughs> earlier. So, um, you know, if you're defining success milestones, for example, as opposed to specific KPIs, what does that process look like? Um, so we heard some very um, explicit examples of KPI concepts, and you know, I'm sure anybody who builds data centers, you hear about latency, packet deliveries, and uptime and availability, and obviously ROI and these things. Um, you know, generally how I've ever thought of when I develop a product or a service is I, in my life, have been well served thinking of this principle of called the trilemma, and being in the communications world, fundamentally, the trilemma that has steered me in a, the, the proper direction most of the time was the concept of cheap, fast, and good. You can only circle two at any time. Mm -hmm. Now, you may decide to circle different variables in that trilemma, but you can never circle three. You circle all three in some way, shape, or form, you're going to miss on delivering that value proposition, or what's going to end up happening is you're, you're fundamentally going to um, miss on being able to to deliver upon the customer's expect, uh, expectations. That's always served me uh, well. Um, you know, in, in talking about uh, maybe some processes that we're going through and redefining KPIs, and I'll give this from an angle from a, a municipal spo uh, uh, focus, but I think anybody who is building uh, infrastructure um, needs to needs to think about this. Is that don't underestimate you know, the, the politicians and don't underestimate these, these cities declaring these climate emergencies. And, you know, if you got a data center and you're, you know, you're pumping through 50 megawatts into that facility, you, you, you are producing energy as a, as, as a, what's considered a waste today. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in that concept of people, planet, profit, you know, is there an opportunity to more tightly ingrain these infrastructures to provide some um, benefit back into the into the community and um, mm -hmm. and and I think there's a lot of opportunities in around that uh, um, you know it's you know I we, we provide uh, district heating to um, uh, housing uh, development here in Hamilton and, uh, and it, it's classic technology and it was put in there probably about 25 years ago but the one thing you'll see in the winter time you just see lots of windows open right mm -hmm. and you wonder well geez it's cold outside well the problem is, is the system is just cranking out heat but it's not cranking out heat relative to mm -hmm. what the consumers need is right it, it, it's too hot mm -hmm. so then it kind of makes you wonder well geez is there is there a way to create a, a variable heat source something that can end up providing something more tied to those uh, consumers needs can you put some type of computing infrastructure in there that can almost be like a variable <coughs> resistor almost that you know closely ties it back to some uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of performance indicator back to providing uh, safe sustainable environmental conditions to community housing as an example so you know I, I think there's a lot of op opportunities in there and, and there is a principle that it's early in development um, it's re being referred to as circular procurement Mm -hmm. And the concept of circular procurement is, well, cost is a factor, and nobody is, is you know, the diminishing the need to be cost relevant. Um, but if you can find sustainable sources into a, a process, and if then you can take the, the waste of a process and help feed it back in, 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 a, in a circular type fashion, and, 
if there is a, a community benefit or an environmental benefit, you're starting to see people of scale now trying to take a look at is how can they award solely uh, on factors that are, are more above than just cost, cost alone. So uh, I think in trying to think about KPIs uh, uh, going forward, especially in this world of edge and, and, and compute is, uh, I think those principles have to be forefront or what you're going to find is you're going to find people are not going to see the value proposition of transitioning to these strategies. Interesting. So the business driver, the business use case is maybe community focused in some cases. Quite possible. Cool. Um, so I'm going to depart from Michael's pattern of panel management. We have a few more minutes left, but I wanted to stop and ask if there's anybody who has a burning question. If anybody, oh, Ron, I thought you might. She's interested in edge. <laughs> um, so since that seems that it's, uh, some applications latency is a driver for deploying edge uh, facility. I wonder whether the here the definition of edge or when you talk about integrated cloud and edge, the edge necessarily means on premise. So if you look at uh, CDM or the success of streaming services in Netflix, yeah. they actually indeed push the server towards the customer without putting it in our home. So I wonder whether this type of solution may address a lot of the latency considerations. Because in a way, if every retail store or hospital deploy their own modular data center, which could be this good business for many people yeah. here, I suppose, but uh, it's not, it doesn't scale or it doesn't, it's actually not very efficient from energy consumption or management yeah. perspective. Mm -hmm. Are you going to take this, Irwin? No, no. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You start, then we can move it down. What we try to do at SickKids is looking at those uh, intelligent internet of things for healthcare, what those applications really mean from latency and bandwidth. But it's also, you're talking about data where you need to make real-time decisions. I don't know if, if you compare it with Netflix from that latency and bandwidth and real-time making decisions if we are in that same um, ballpark. I don't know. I think what we try to figure out is First and foremost, you're talking about sensitive data. Uh, sometimes it's BHA. And if you can keep that local, then that is a, a preference for us. Does it mean that everything will be in that edge computing? But I think for the intelligent Internet of Things for healthcare, that depending on the latency requirements and the bandwidth that we would like to keep it locally in our buildings. It's, if, if I look at our new building, our office building, where we have a main computer room, it can only host 12 racks. So we really need to start thinking about what does it mean of um, traffic that we would like to keep local. And it's early days. I, wrong, I do not have an answer compared with Netflix if, if that is something that we should consider for sure. But I think it's a whole research that we have to do with those applications. Or um, NFB as opposed to Netflix, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, did you want to address that yeah, point, Scott? And I, I think if your question is, is latency a driver? I think it definitely is, right? It, it's a driver for all the for, for way businesses look at how they're going to deploy edge, but that is a, again, it's a business decision. Netflix has made a decision based on what they think the acceptable latency is. I mean, Netflix is 100% cloud-based, right? So I think they're AWS, I could be wrong, but I think, so, so they're not totally at the edge. They're not at your house. They're wherever AWS is. They made a decision on on, on the band on, on the latency that allows the streaming, so that's their decision. Whereas a hospital makes a decision on latency on how they're going to deal with certain things, mm -hmm. NFB would make a decision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the way the way we we see our customers and our clients looking at it is case by case, application by application. They will consider what the best method is for them to deliver the service to their customer. Yeah. And latency plays a factor in that. Yeah. Uh, as well as other things as we talked about, customer experience, costs, et cetera, so yes. So, and Erwin, you've built quite a grid of inputs to, you know, that decision making for mm -hmm. each application, yeah. Yeah. you know, because the needs vary, the business needs vary. Anybody else, a burning question? Yes, down here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but. So, I'll yell. Uh, <laughs> okay. What uh, I have.
gray hair, so I remember a thing called distributed computing and system 36s and AS 400s and crazy stuff like that. Where, you know, if we're talking about, for example, systems in retail establishments and bank branches, etc., that to me sounds like distributed computing. There are very good reasons for that. What's the differentiator between distributed computing and what is really edge computing? where it's sort of living outside of your premises, but in some new place, maybe it's a cell tower, maybe it's a different service by a, a cloudy type provider. Have you given some thought to, to everything Erwin's talking about sounds like it's distributed computing, sorry, uh, within the sick kids premises. So you know, what are the other use cases that, that we need to think about? I, I don't think there is a difference. I think it, it is distributed computing. Yeah. That, that's the way we've looked at it. The name just changed. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to work for United Parcel Service. We were at the edge back when we started tracking packages. So it, the name has just shifted. It's, 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 it, it, companies have been doing it for, well, maybe even decades, right? They just called it something different. Um, and I think part of it is because in a distributed environment, if, and I'm kind of dating myself as well, but. With AS400s, we always looked at that being confined to the bricks and mortar, the glass house, whereas Edge is not really totally confined to that, even though it is distributed. So, I mean, that, that to me may be the only difference, but I, would, I, I don't think there is a difference. So, Jeff, do you want to um, add to that? Because we had a pretty interesting discussion about what you might see at the Edge in some of the communications deployments. I think I've only seen one AS400 in my life. <laughs> yeah, they were talking about some protocol SNA and all this stuff. And I'm like, that sounds like a big thing. Um, maybe it's just the scale at which you think about it, right? Um, like, you know, can you envision a community where there's no traffic lights at intersections anymore? And you have vehicles that operate autonomously with one another that are situationally aware, but they also have broader context about what's happening within the community around them and they can move in such a fashion that you actually do not need to have the form of a centralized controller distributed a million times over within a within the community right you, you know there's a command and control element that happens very very immediate and localized to where that point of necessity is and i think maybe in the what is edge versus distributed versus whatever it may be is that I think there's just a general overall level of sophistication around orchestration mm -hmm. of this that we have just never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that I, we're just learning, mm -hmm. that we're just about, about to see. Mm -hmm. um, that maybe is taken from confines that we kind of relate to today, we can use principles from back in the day, but I think when you really start possibly looking at you know, what does it mean when people don't have cars, you call a car and your car is sitting at a, 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 a garage that's also a energy demand source, that is also a data center that then is coming to fill your need and then going back. It's, it, there's, a, there's a relative of orchestration that we've just never, we've never seen. And so I think when, aside from that, just marketing and people just trying to figure out new value and get you buy more stuff and things along those lines, which may be a little bit of it, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just contextualizing future scale. Mm -hmm. And clouds at the edge, too. Yeah. So um, I know that we're on time. <laughs> he says out, I say on. Um, so could we just have a really quick um, thought from each of you on what's next in cloud and edge? MJ? On my side, really, is the first thing, and we haven't spoken about it. We spoke about it all through the last few yes. days, is data. Yeah. We need to transform the data into information and transform it into knowledge. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, one other thing is trying, I have many, 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 many services on the edge, on the cloud, in on-premise. How am I going to be able to track those, track the audience that goes there, and track all this information? So that's number one for me, because data is, is number one. Second thing and is basically trying to have specialized service on demand. So I'm talking about um, rendering farms, encoding farms, et cetera, that are in my industry. So I could go and basically uh, use that service and, and leave the service. This would uh, have that kind of impact that I don't have to buy that much hardware so I can go bare minimum and just buy. 
And if the business model is interesting, i.e. cost not too prohibitive, mm -hmm. completely get rid of those mm -hmm. specialized high compute that mm -hmm. I don't need that much equipment. <laughs> he doesn't have a leg to stand on. We were all here for the first panel of the morning. Um, <laughs> Um, so Irwin, and you'll still be here when we say the next one. <laughs> it starts in minus one minute. Um, just a, a quick word from you. Priorities. Next. I would say be agile, focus uh -huh. on business outcomes, explore, research, research, talk to peers in your industry, outside the industry, and make sure that you don't forget your business. Okay. Okay. Jeff? Anything exciting in Hamilton? Uh, like none of this is a technology problem. This is all about managing people. It's about managing perception. It's about being able to articulate it. Mm -hmm. And it's about um, uh, establishing cadence, right? Uh, small successes. It's like, how do you eat an elephant? You just take one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. And you know, for most organizations, it's not going to be like you're just going to fall into it. You're going to have to get mm -hmm. there incrementally. Mm -hmm. So Scott, um, the fact that people haven't figured it out yet is a good opportunity for you. Yeah, so what are you thinking about next? How will you help these guys? Actually, what I'm thinking about next is when we stop talking about it, that means it's mainstream, right? Because yes. that's, that's what the, so that's what I think is next. We'll stop talking about it because okay. everybody will be doing it. Okay. Uh, and that it'll just be commonplace, and it will be, it won't be a, uh, it won't be a keynote at, at all these conferences we go. To. <laughs> so that, that, that I think is what's really next is that'll just be mainstream. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for your patience with 55 seconds over time. I enjoyed every moment of it, and I really appreciate your input, guys. Thanks so much for your. Input.